Good afternoon and welcome to part two of Clinically Effective GI Treatments Utilizing the GI MAP Test. I'm your host, Jeff Ingersoll. Today's presenter, Dr. Dan Kalish, will present the second of this two-part webinar, which covers proven treatment methods using functional medicine lab assessments and botanical treatments for chronic GI conditions. A recent study published by Dr. Kalish and Mayo Clinic researchers demonstrated 93% clearance of GI pathogens using a combined approach focused on lifestyle changes and herbal antimicrobials. And for those who didn't join us the first time, um, I will give a brief introduction of Dr. Kalish. Over the past 25 years, Daniel Kalish, DC, has directed three integrative health clinics in California where he has coordinated teams of medical doctors, nutritionists, chiropractors, and acupuncturists. He now maintains an active international consultation practice with patients around the world. Dr. Kalish studied at the University of London and conducted research with biochemist Dr. Robin Monroe at Cambridge University. His studies led him to mentoring with renowned psychiatrist R.D. Lang, as well as John R. Lee, M.D., a pioneer in the use of progesterone, and to teaching collaborations with leading endocrinologist Diana Schwartzbein. He is the author of three books, The Five Pillars to Building a Successful Practice, The Kalish Method, Healing the Body, Mapping the Mind, and Your Guide to Healthy Hormones. And he is a frequently requested speaker for integrative medicine conferences across the United States. Dr. Daniel Kalish is dedicated to teaching doctors functional medicine, philosophy, and practices. Through the Kalish Institute's educational programs, he has trained over 1,000 practitioners worldwide in the Kalish method, which solves patient challenges through a proven lab-based approach. In May of 2016, a research study published by two Mayo Clinic researchers confirmed the efficacy of the Kalish method, showing significant improvements in GI health and quality of life in the study participants. The study was based on Dr. Kalish's model of functional medicine based on his 25 years of successful clinical results. Graduates of the Kalish Institute include practitioners ranging from Dr. McCullough's medical staff to Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic physicians. And I do know that the next Kalish Method mentorship starts on September 5th. I know that enrollment is limited, and I don't know if st spots are still available, but to get more information or to find out, you can go to www.kalishinstitute.com. And now for the second part of the presentation is Dr. Kalish. Thank you very much, Jeff. Appreciate it. Yes. Wow. You know, we were just talking offline. I just got to say this to everybody listening. that. This is the, the golden period of functional medicine just began about 12 months ago where, you know, we've been toiling away. I've been doing this for 25 years for real. Like I, I was passionate about functional medicine 25 years ago and to see it hit where it has now in these last 12 months is just incredible. It is now on fire. You talk to the supplement company owners, the lab company owners talk to the anybody in our industry who's tracking the economics of this and we're in a major growth spurt right now and I feel like the as the profession grows like one of my roles being like an old timer now is to maintain the integrity of the profession and to teach people what I was taught by my teachers 25 years ago who were doing this stuff way back in the 60s and 70s and that I want to have this sense of continuity so newer practitioners come in, coming in, you know, get a sense of the roots of the profession and we can stay true to who we are even though we're growing exponentially. And when I think about one of my major teachers, Dr. Bill Timmons, naturopath, passed away a bunch of years ago. Before you could talk to Dr. Timmons, 100% of patients had to do a GI test. It didn't matter if you were depressed, if you had toenail fungus, it didn't matter if you had cancer or heart disease, it didn't matter if you were about to die or you were just looking for a tune-up so you could ride your bike faster. 100% of his patients did a GI test before he would even do the new patient consult. And so 
when I started my practice, I was like, oh, I can't do that. That's just too weird. So I spent, you know, 20 years basically pitching patients on doing a stool test, you know, and it's hard sometimes. If they don't have a digestive problem, who wants to do a stool test? Nobody does. But now, for the last five or so years, maybe four years, I am taking on Dr. Timmons, you know, persona. And every single patient that I talk to, before I talk to them, they talk to my assistant first, has to do a GI test. That's how important this is. It's just not like optional because you have a digestive symptom, you do a GI test. This is every single patient in a functional medicine practice needs to do a GI map test. I really mean that. And this is not a sales gimmick. This is not a promotional thing. This is the heart and soul of functional medicine and always has been going back 50 years. You find, here's the two things. This is what Tim has taught me. You find, well, first of all, you test every single patient for GI stuff because it's not symptom-oriented treatment. We're not doing symptoms here. We're looking at function, not symptoms. So it doesn't matter what their symptoms are. You test their GI. The GI is the mother of the rest of the body. You have to start here. Second thing is that you find the current testing company or companies that have the best technology in terms of recovery and finding bugs. Okay, 25 years ago, they didn't have this fancy pants DNA probe slash PCR testing that we're talking about right now. It was old-fashioned human being in a microscope, you know. But you stick with wherever the best technology is for finding pathogens, which I believe right now is in the hands of the folks that are running the GI map lab. And that's why I'm doing this talk. So you got to test everybody. Use the best technology. Use the GI map test. If you're, if you're missing out on the vote on that, then you're really going to end up in trouble. And I'll tell you, not pe people don't listen to this. I, I, um, I didn't listen to his advice for three or four years. My first four years in practice, I only tested the GI, uh, the GI tract of my GI cases. In my mind, a GI case was someone that had GI symptoms. So for four years, I probably missed most of the GI infections coming through my clinic, and can kind of regret that now. So anyway, so I just want to advocate for that. You may not do it for three or four years yourself, but when you do start to test everyone. Uh, with, a, with a GI test, you're going to just have this whole new world um, of things open up. So I just want to do a quick review of where we left off. We, took to, we talked about the, the stress component, a little bit about my treatment models, how to work with patients, and we talked a lot about adrenals and how stress plays into gut-related problems. And in the Mayo Clinic study, which was quite successful, I think we had like 83% clearance rates or something like that. We got rid of almost all the GI bugs. We did really focus on adrenals and lifestyle as an initial opening, and then we got into the elimination of the pathogens. So again, this is in a context. It's not just that you do the pathogen screen, find the GRDNH pylori, and then kill it. You have to address the patient and, and why this problem came about in the first place. Um, and we'll talk a lot about this too, and then maybe towards the end of today. But also addressing the microbiome and making sure that you're leaving that person once you've gotten rid of the pathogens with a healthy microbiome, so this problem doesn't just regenerate itself and come back. You want to, as much as possible, obviously, get in there and fix things. And here's the test itself. It's pretty easy to read, right? You either have the problem or you don't. There's not a lot of study you need to do in terms of interpretation. Um, however, I think there's a lot of subtleties that I've learned from working with the lab company where one indicator might hint at something that you may not know otherwise. So the more you can educate yourself about various findings on here, I think the more effective you can be as a clinician. And I know I was, um, we were doing an interview with Tony Hoffman the other day, and he mentioned how Morganella in some people as commonly associated with uh, people showing positive on a SIBO test. And so there's little hints like that, that you may get um, from doing educational work around this test to get you a little more into it. Again, we're, we're looking at a DNA analysis. We're looking at a whole other level of technology here. And I'm an early adopter for sure, and I love technology. And I um, go ba way back with PCR testing. I got some of the first test kits when the, this type of testing technology first came out 15 years ago and the level of improvement now in terms of the accuracy and the reliability of the testing is really quite dramatic. So we talked a lot about adrenals, kind of flip through these and we know that high stress is bad but I want to today focus more on the gut part of all this and making sure that you're addressing the adrenals you're not just blowing that off because if you go right to gut testing and right I mean right to gut corrections you're going to end up with 
know, not as fat, not as satisfactory result as you may have otherwise. So in the beginning, when you know the beginning is the first maybe five years, you may want to just test patients who aren't doing well. They're not responding to the diet changes. They're not responding to supplements. They have a long history of GI problems. They have ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, IBS, IB, constipation, diarrhea. There's something going on. Those first five years, you may limit it to just that group. Obvious, long-standing GI problems. That's probably the easiest group that you can end up testing. But ultimately, I would all, you know, challenge you all to eventually move to the sort of classic naturopathic position in this argument, which is to just test everybody. Um, and don't let people slip through your clinic that, that have a, a problem with a gut infection. You really don't want to miss that. When, and this is, it kind of takes a little while to wrap your mind around, I think, is that you know, the, the stress GI connection, which is dwell on this for a minute, is that as, and we talked about this a lot last time too, but as your gut becomes damaged, you're going to use amino acids as a fuel source. And you're going to experience all kinds of physical damage to the gut from the stress that you're under. And that's why we work with the adrenals and the gut at the same time. And usually when people think about that, you know, I'm stressed, I'm using amino acids for fuel, they think of the breaking down of lean muscle mass and sarcopenia and those kinds of problems. But what we want to say in addition to that is that glutamine is easily broken down in the gut lining. So when you're stressed, you're going to develop a leaky gut, whether you have a GI pathogen yet or not. And obviously as that progresses and the stress gets worse, and the immune system starts to falter, and people start to pick up bugs. So I want to talk about the bugs today and eradication of bugs. And I still have a great joy that comes to me, which is a twisted and strange thing to say, when we get a GI map test back and I see, oh, they have H. pylori. This is cool. Or cryptosporidium. I get, I get I'm like physically excited. I'm like, yeah, crypto. Because I know that I can help the person. And becoming a... Uh, you know, having done like a thousand crypto cases, I don't know, maybe 15 pylori cases, you just know what's going to happen to the person and how much better they're going to feel. So it's an exciting moment. Whenever I get a patient file in and all the labs are back, 100% of the time I ignore the hormone findings. I kind of push aside the organic acids panel, and I always look at the GI map first because that's where I'm like, oh, does this person have a pathogen or not? Now. The, the tricky part about being so in love with killing pathogens, I was to give you the dark side of the problem, of the situation. The tricky side of it is that, yeah, 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 you're going to get people better when you treat pathogens. And that's exciting and fun, and it really does work extraordinarily well. However, it's a little in fine print at the bottom. We become susceptible to these infections when the adrenal glands burn out, and Cig A levels drop when we're stressed and we're burning up that glutamine as a fuel source and we're creating that leaky gut. And we become highly susceptible to these infections when the healthy, natural microbiota become out of balance. So there's a context to this. And I spent so many years just obsessing on the killing part that now in my old age here, <laughs> age 53, after 20 blah, years of doing this, I really get that, okay, yeah, it is exciting and cool to find and treat the pathogen. But we also want to put a lot of attention to the restoration of the healthy microbiome at the end of this process. It's super, super important. More important than I used to realize. So we want to be experts at killing, but also experts at restoration and repair. And you can be, you can do both. Commonly detected parasites, crypto, giardia, ehisto, blasto. I see one or more of these every week in my practice. Literally every week, year after year after year after year. And um, I have a certain, I don't know if fondness is the right word, but a certain respect for each of these bugs in slightly different ways. Clinical application-wise, just a few things. Cryptosporidium, 
those are the patients oftentimes that have a cycling set of symptoms. They'll be like, I don't know, four or five days of every month, I just have really bad GI symptoms and I barely get to work because I'm so tired. And then I feel better. That's oftentimes a crypto case or something like crypto where the infection is flaring up and then dying down and flaring up and dying down. If it's a woman, she may obviously associate a monthly fluctuation in symptoms with her menstrual cycle, but sometimes it can be something like cryptosporidium. Giardia is, I'm just giving you classic tips on each one. Giardia is the classic, I have chemical sensitivity parasite. Giardia damages absorption of essential fatty acids. It destroys the, the ability of the body to create that phospholipid bilayer that you know, is cell membrane in every cell. So you get weak cell membranes, you get chemicals just penetrating through. And Giardia is kind of a classic connector, uh, connector not only to GI symptoms, obviously GI symptoms, but also to people that have chemical symptoms. Entamoeba histolytica is probably the one that I'm the most afraid of. Um, when I see e-histo, it's like a double alarm bell going off because some e-histo cases can be extremely ill. And it's probably the only one of these infections out of all the things that we talk about where I get really nervous if we're going to just do an herbal program. I feel much more relaxed if we're open to using some prescription antiparasitic drugs. So e-histo is just, it's, it has the potential for a lot of really destructive action in the gut. By its very name you can see histo, well, and lytica is lysis. It cuts into that layer, uh, muscular layer uh, right around the gut lining. We have the tube of the gut, it penetrates up in the gut uh, and tissue itself. It can be very, very destructive. It can migrate to your liver, cause problems in the liver itself as well. It's nasty little bug. Blasto is a common one. It can cause anything like uh, from joint pain to extreme fatigue. And for reasons I don't understand, it's very commonly accompanied by H. pylori. So it's just something to keep in the back of your mind about blasto. If you see blasto, get suspicious about H. pylori. They often come together. Sometimes the labs will find them both. Sometimes they'll miss one together. So anyways, these are some of my favorite infections, and we deal with them every day of the week. It's wonderful to, to have these kind of problems. Now, uh, H. pylori is somewhat controversial, right, because some people, in some situations, H. pylori can actually be protective or helpful. In my clinic in general, you know, obviously I'm working with people who are sick, and almost always treat H. pylori. I'd say every case I can remember in the last five, ten years of H. pylori we treat. But it is true in some people who are not sick, you know, H. pylori can be uh, commensal and even can be protective in some ways if your immune system is pretty good. Those are just not the kind of patients that come into my clinic. So we do treat pretty much almost all the H. pyloris that come through our doors. C. difficile, we see this frequently. Again, bacterial infections of the GI tract. That can be a nasty one to deal with. You can often flush it out with Saccharomyces boulardii if you know, push on that. And in the Mayo Clinic study, we had nine of the patients that had H. pylori, and we got rid of uh, H. pylori with eight of them. So I definitely can see improvements in symptoms like energy levels and mood and GI function, as well as um, the benefits that you're going to see in terms of the stomach just performing better, right? The stomach's able to absorb nutrients better have this infection that's dangerous. So not everybody having H. pylori needs to be treated, depending on what your clinic is like. If you have a wellness practice, you may have some people that have H. pylori uh, in whom we don't need to get rid of it. But patients that I work with, quite chronically ill, you see heartburn, gastroesophageal reflux, bloating, all these kinds of problems. And not regular bloating, but bloating like, you know, poofing out like a basketball right after you eat. And then yeast overgrowth. You know, I don't know, you can go back to the 1970s with the guy, with a, what an unfortunate name, Dr. Crook. <laughs> I don't know, he should have changed his name. But anyways, Dr. Crook wasn't a crook. He was a candida expert. You know, a long, long, long time ago, he wrote these books about yeast overgrowth. So I think, at least when I first started my practice, yeast overgrowth was kind of overly treated. Like everybody, every natural health practitioner treated every patient for yeast overgrowth. But now I don't know if that's still true or not. Maybe it's something that we, we can miss pretty easily and can be extraordinarily damaging. Um, more so than just the can, you know, sort of casual candida problem. 
a significant yeast overgrowth can just bring a, a patient just to their knees. And, you know, very well treated, very effectively treated with the herbal methods that we use in functional medicine. So that's a, not that I'm saying that's easy to do, but something that's very doable. Now, when I look at programs and I look at um, why functional medicine programs fail, it is usually, I mean, let me tell you things that are the same. So like in, in my clinic and a clinic that may treat a patient where there's a failure, we're using the same basic supplements. I mean, you go to any IFM conference and you see the same supplement companies there. Douglas, Orthomolecular, Metagenics, Designs for Health, you know, Pure Encapsulations. It's not a big mystery. I'm not using, you know, better products than anyone, that's for sure. You work with one of these professional companies. Um, let's say in our situation, we're all using the GI map, so we're all in an even playing field in terms of detecting what infections are present. And then why do I guess, you know, the bulk of my practice now the last couple of years, it's patients that have worked with another functional medicine doctor and it didn't work, and now they're coming to see me. I don't know why. That's just sort of the trend that I'm seeing now. More than half of my patients have had a program that they tried and it failed. And so, I, you know, again, it's not that I have better quality supplements. If you're using the GI map, we all, everyone's on equal ground in terms of what's wrong. It really comes down to sequencing problems, patient communication issues. And just the, what is it? It's the, the stuff they don't teach you in school part, you know, about how to make these programs work. So the most glaring and obvious problem is simply sequencing. So treating the GI tract first is just much more likely to not work than, than if you treat it second. So going after the neuroendocrine system getting that cortisol or thyroid or neurotransmitter support in place. Okay, yes, so the person's feeling better. That's part of why we do it. But ultimately, so you reduce their stress, so their leaky gut that's being all chewed up and damaged every moment of their lives starts to calm down. It gives you time to work with the diet and reduce inflammation so that when you go to the killing phase, it's much more likely to work. And then some amount of detox support towards the end of the whole process. Typically, there's obviously some exceptions to that, which we can look at too. So this is the standard treatment sequence that I was taught. It's worked really well for me over the years. And I do believe my success rate is pretty high um, because of the hesitation I have to jump in and treat the GI tract right away. Now, there's exceptions to every rule, right? So let's say, for example, uh, this is a classic thing that just happened to me. A um, woman wants to get pregnant in two or three months, you know, and she has Giardia. Well, you don't want her to be pregnant and have Giardia. And you're not going to want to wait for two months to treat it, and then she's getting pregnant. That's a mess. So, yeah, you could obviously, you know, treat the Giardia right away if you have a timeline like that, that you just can't wait. Or I work with a lot of professional athletes. Okay, it's, you know, hockey season is starting in you know five weeks Dan and you know I gotta go play hockey in New York I'm like okay well I guess you know we better not wait right we're gonna treat your H pylori right now today and we're not gonna wait and you know put you on an adrenal program for two months you know so there's reasons why you might want to accelerate it but to the, to the extent possible I right, really try to follow the sequence where we spend the first couple months working with the neuroendocrine and the lifestyle and then we start killing everything we possibly can. Right, and, that, and then we start at the end, once the GI program is starting to wind down, we look at detoxification and trying to clear up the liver, all the damage that may have happened to the liver. So again, timing and sequencing, being able to work with a diet for one or two months, work with the adrenals or the thyroid, whatever it is, for one or two months. And then that second step then, being clearing the GI bugs as necessary while supporting liver detoxification. So what does as necessary mean? Well, I try, I'm a minimalist on the supplement side. So if I can get away with a killing program for H. pylori or Giardia without liver support, then I'll try to do that. And if the person starts crashing and they have a lot of side effects or symptoms, then I'll throw in the liver support. If you want to be a little more careful, you can do liver support 
right off the bat. But I like to wait until I see what's needed and then do the detox protocols at the end after the killing phase is done. And then this last phase here, we can talk a lot about if we have some time, is repairing damage from the infection. Maybe they had a Giardia problem and you want to do an anti-yeast protocol now. Maybe you need to do some probiotics or prebiotics or leaky gut repair. That's usually going to happen a little bit later on. Now, I think one of the probably the hardest thing in all of this, let's say you get the test done, you get your lab back, you know they have the e-histo, you got the e-histo cleared out, you know, everything's kind of moving along. Now you you're you're far enough into this case where the, the patient is infection free and you know their gut is clear of the infection. Now, in a way, at that moment the hard work begins because now you have to focus on repairing the damage from the infection, whatever that may be, whether it's a yeast protocol, anti-yeast protocol. Let's say that they um, had e histo and they had to take antibiotics and they have a rebound yeast overgrowth. Now you have to deal with the yeast overgrowth. You, know? um, you may need to, uh, almost always will need to spend a fair amount of time using probiotics and prebiotics and some kind of leaky gut repair to restore the health of the microbiome. And now that I you know, I'll be honest, I'll tell you how I used to do it. This is the, the old way was uh, your e-histo is gone. Uh, I'll give you my inner dialogue, not what I say to the patient. But this is what I would be doing. Uh, I'd be thinking, your e-histo is gone. You should think I'm an amazing doctor because I'm the only one that ever found out why you were sick and had Crohn's and ulcerative colitis in the first place. And now you have no more Crohn's disease and your ulcerative colitis is in remission and your GI doctor can't believe it and you're, you're, you're better. And so I'm just, you know, being Mr. Superior Functional Medicine guy, I've figured all this out. And then in the back of my mind, I think, oh, yeah, we should probably tune up your microbiome a little bit. I should give you some probiotics for a month or two. But honestly, I'm not going to really track what you get those, and I'm not going to, you know, that was been my attitude was like, hey, if I can find e and kill it, I've pretty much done my job. And we basically leave patients on their own to figure out the whole microbiome restoration part. I would for sure suggest they take probiotics for two months and, you know, but not require it and not track it and not have any way of knowing whether they actually did that or not. That was my old attitude. My new attitude now in the last couple of years is, okay, I found the e-histo, got rid of it, your ulcerative colitis is gone. How hard was that? Whatever. And I just, that is what we did with functional medicine. That wasn't very hard. Anyone can do that. Now, i got to figure out how to restore your microbiome and make sure that your gut is impervious to future infections because your healthy bacterial counts are back to normal. And in fact, if you look really carefully at the GI map, there's a whole section on commensal or normal bacteria. We have to get commensal or normal bacteria rebalanced in order to ensure that the infections won't come back. And in fact, you could argue really the opposite in a way and say that the reason why these infections become so problematic is because of the imbalance in the, in the healthy bacteria in the first place, the commensal one more. So anyways, this last step is way harder than you would think and way more important. And in fact, if I was really kind of redefining how I look at this now, like I was for 20 years, find the pathogen, kill the pathogen, my job is done. Basic attitude. And by the way, that's a hard thing to figure out, you know, give myself some credit. I mean, it takes you a half a dozen years to figure that out. But now I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Find the pathogen, kill the pathogen, that's step one. The more important part of this is to make sure that we get the entire microbiome back. And not just giving a brief little, you know, take some probiotics and help this works kind of thing, but really to emphasize that quite a bit, right? So let's take a look at the other manifestations of all this. Let me go along here. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we want to work on the liver because the liver tends to become overburdened from an overburdened GI tract. So that's a really important concept. And making sure that once the GI protocols are coming to an end, you're starting to support the liver as appropriate with herbs with uh, phase one, phase two liver support, whatever your favorites are. There's some basics that pretty much everybody needs for their healthy liver. The vitamins are obvious. 
antioxidants are obvious, and then the sulfur-containing compounds like glycine and taurine and glutamine and n acetylcysteine you know, making sure that the liver gets tuned up at the end of this whole process is important. And then to just, you know, assume, because this is, you know, two of the most people that we work with, that there's going to be some amount of oxidative stress from the GI tissue damage and the GI infection. So if you have someone with e-histo or crypto or something like that, making sure that you're checking their mitochondrial function, looking at an organic acids profile, and, and getting that taken care of as a, not really as an aside, but as part of the overall treatment, making sure you're dealing with that. And oxidative stress is such an important issue, you don't want to just blow that off. And then, you know, again, you may have cleared the infections, but still have food allergies, still be struggling with a patient that has a gluten problem. We don't want to ignore the leaky gut and the food contributions to this. And sometimes those kinds of treatments can go on for quite some time. We talked a lot about how catabolic physiology, when we're stressed, leads to the breaking down uh, of the gut lining because we take up glutamine for fuel, which is a, you know, an understandable but potentially harmful uh, process that people go through. And this just comes right back to obviously using glutamine-related products to help repair. Um, most every company will have some kind of a powder that has glutamine in it that you can use to repair gut function. And I use those in every patient that I can convince to do them. Very important uh, aspect to the you know, final part of the correction of the gut. And then having a general understanding of the progression of leaky gut. And you know, in, in other words, you could have an infection in the gut that triggered an autoimmune process. So just clearing the gut may not be enough. You may have have a person who has systemic inflammation and joint pain throughout their body. So just getting rid of that you know, potential autoimmune bacteria that's triggered all this may not be enough. You know, you may need to, again, work with other areas of the body to complete a whole program. And then thinking about the keys to success, right, I talked a lot about strengthening the gay and the neuroendocrine systems in general. And then I want to focus on this for a moment because, again, this is a part that I missed for so many years that I just want to make sure that we think through how, okay, we're now, here's the position. We, we, we got this sick person. We tested and corrected their thyroid or adrenals or brain, got them feeling better. We found out from the GI map that they have blastocystis hominis and a geotrichum overgrowth. So we treated the fungal overgrowth, we treated the parasitic problem. They're mostly better now, but we're wondering, okay, what's the, the, final, the final step in all of it treatment-wise? And just handing them a couple bottles of probiotics and just blowing them off, you know, maybe not the best option. To start to really think about the bacteria, the anaerobes in the large intestine, and what can we do to get these bacteria back in shape. And these beneficial bacteria are absolutely essential. As a matter of fact, I read the other day the metabolic power and functioning of the healthy commensal bacteria in the gut is equal to the metabolic power and functioning of the human liver. That really put it in perspective for me. So and in a sense, this microbiome is a organ system unto itself as powerful as your liver. That's that important. And remember when we were in school and taking some physiology tests and they would always joke, you know, if you don't know the answer to the test, but liver, because the liver does everything. You know, this is you know, mission critical for function. So dealing with dysbiosis, this would be an overgrowth of these quote-unquote normal, normal bacteria, right? They're not necessarily pathogens. However, if a commensal bacteria overgrows massively, it can cause a lot of symptoms. You don't have to have a pathogen to be triggering symptoms. So you want to really be able to focus on prebiotics and on supplying the nutrients, supplements, foods that the healthy bacteria need in the gut to grow well. And there's two general categories. You can actually test for this on organic acids. There's a four, four most people don't know this, but on the organic acids test, there's four or five markers. Uh, and it's depending on how you count them, maybe four to six markers that look at polyphenol, the effect of polyphenols 
a lot of gut bacteria. And basically, you eat fruits and vegetables that have polyphenols in them, and that is a fuel supply for the good bacteria. They break it, the polyphenols down. That's really how the good bacteria, one way the good bacteria can start to grow really healthily. And then the other way you can stimulate the growth without supplements, without prebiotics or, or probiotics, is to um, have the person increase their consumption of legumes or beans. The fiber and beans, a food supply for the good bacteria, polyphenols and fruits and vegetables. So a lot of this can be accompanied or accomplished by you know getting people to eat more plants, basically. In addition to prebiotic supplements and probiotic supplements as well. And I do it all because I take this step much more seriously now than I used to. So I use prebiotic supplements, probiotic supplements, and dietary changes to make sure that we're really pushing the person back to a healthy microbiome. Because that's going to be the insurance policy they don't go through this again. Follow-up testing. I'll tell you honestly, this is not an easy thing to pull off. I suggest follow-up testing to every single patient. I'm lucky if I get half of my patients to do a follow-up stool test. No matter how much I yell and scream, maybe I, I just haven't figured out the best technique to force them into doing it. Maybe you could sell them both tests at the beginning so they would be trapped into having two test kits or something. But um, especially when people are, you know, feel so much better, it's, it, their motivation for doing another stool test as well. But I do, you know, I would say I require it with certain infections like e um, For lighter weight infections, maybe they have like endolemics and the other or something like that, you know, maybe I understand if their GI symptoms are all gone, they're not going to test. But I do encourage it, and I want it, and I write it into the programs. We probably get about 50% of our patients to actually comply with that. And again, here's the basic timeline that we're working with as we're doing a workup on a GI case, starting off with the diet and anti-inflammatory programs and working with the hormones and the treatment of the gut and then, look, you know, sort of segueing into supporting the liver and so on. And then again, a sequence, adrenals and lifestyle, killing the bugs, putting, and then this huge emphasis now, as I'm trying to make today, on getting the healthy bacteria back. So that that's, the step three is not an afterthought, as it was for me for so many years. Step three is the goal. Step three is the, you know, the most important step. Step three is where you're heading. It's the, it's the end of the process. And it's, you know, not just an add-on, Oh, maybe take some probiotics, but it's really an essential, or perhaps the essential component. It's what you're building up to. And okay, you know, for all those years, I I was most excited by the killing of the bugs phase, um, not realizing that this last phase really, really important. Otherwise, people are going to come back and they're going to have the problem to back again and have to retreat them. Which is bummer. So integrating the treatment programs again, three different phases, making sure that you're working with the diet. Digestive enzymes, and there's a marker on the GI map for enzyme problems. We use these quite a bit if people need them. They can help extremely with certain people in the beginning. Uh, we mostly don't want to just get people addicted to them, but they can work really well. And then the killing of the bugs phase. I have a variety of products that we use. They you know, contain the classic ingredients. Um, I love berberine for gut clearing. I know it's good for other things as well. I like olive leaf extract. Absolutely love grapefruit seed. Um, sweet wormwood or artemisia, I love it, but you have to be careful. I've seen two people end up in the emergency room from artemisia overdoses. So be careful with that. As effective as it is, you've got to monitor people really carefully if you're going to use that one. Uva ursi, clove, mastica, we use a lot of mastica. Or H. pylori. And if you are using artemisia, it just, it just needs to be monitored. You just need to make sure that patients have good liver function and that they're not taking an excessive amount of the artemisia. As effective as it is, it can be a little risky. That's the only time I've ever seen a gut treatment put someone in the emergency room is with artemisia. So I'm a little cautious on that. It just, I think it's dose related. You know, you've got to keep doses. The dosage is kind of conservative with the dosage as well. Um, recolonization, repair, reevaluation, talked a lot about that already. And then anti inflammatory ingredients. So these are the typical products that you'll see when you're getting into that GI repair phase. Things like glutamine and uh, slippery elm and sort of classic ways of repairing the gut. 
and most companies will have a combination product, and that should be a you know, a, you know key component of your overall treatment program. Of course, probiotics, which we mentioned, and prebiotics. I don't have a slide on that, but you know, prebiotics are equally important so that the person is able to get the recolonization of the bacteria. Now, obviously, when you take a probiotic, it doesn't end up magically in your intestinal tract, but the probiotics that we swallow and take orally have an impact on uh, the, the microbes in your gut. They're not going to go from the pill that you swallow into your large intestine directly, but they still have an impact that's very positive. And of course, there's a more extreme treatment for this with uh, fecal transplants that have become quite popular lately. Um, and that's another way, a little more extreme. Most people aren't going to want to really deal with that. Although, we've got some new work coming out on that too. And I see a lot of the more advanced GI doctors, you know, heading in that direction more and more, looking at fecal transplants for their, their most difficult cases. So GI map case study review. I want to show you a couple of examples here. And these are real patients of mine. And again, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm not the best person to teach this class because I love this stuff so much. <laughs> Maybe a little distorted view. But I get pretty excited when I see a GI map test come in. And just to review quickly, those of you that haven't seen a ton of these, there's the bacterial pathogens. Parasites are listed on this page and they're also listed further down. Viral pathogens. Those are the parasit parasites that are considered pathogens. There are all these wonderful markers for H. pylori. The normal bacterial flora that I mentioned, right, this is essential for us to restore at the end of the killing of the pathogens. So if you have something like a low lactobacillus or a high level of bacteroides or whatever it may be, something that you want to correct for. The potential autoimmune triggers, I had a really good case just actually a couple days ago with someone with two of these autoimmune triggers, 22-year-old woman just started to develop autoimmune symptoms two months ago. We did this test, nailed it, super satisfying to have these markers on here, it really help a lot of people, if you can, especially if you can catch them in the early stages of autoimmune development. And then blasto, you mentioned my, I'll circle some of my favorites here, treat blasto routinely. Dianetomipa fragilis, I see a fair amount of time. That will be pretty destructive as well. Um, it's really nice to have these yeast markers on here. As you all probably know, it's very difficult for lab companies to accurately test for yeast because I think part of the technical problem is that, you know, by the time the samples arrive in the lab, most of these chemicals that are preserving the sample are designed to help with recovery of parasites. So the more, you know, old-fashioned testing that we've been doing for a lot of years, often this is silver growth. And I, I'm finding the GI map is really nice. Uh, and more accurate way to find yeast overgrowth that we might have missed in another situation. So, and then the more pathogens that show up, the more excited I get. Here's a diff case. Again, autoimmune triggers. Ooh, look at this one. Wow. Antimia fragilis and endolamics nana and a candida overgrowth all at the same time. That must hurt. Sometimes these tests come back and you just can't believe it. People are still walking and talking. You know, they got so many things going on. But there's my little endolamics nana. Yeast overgrowth. One uh, like a little side effect, or not a side effect, but a side note on yeast. You know, sometimes the yeast overgrowth is not that severe in the labs, but the treatment of the yeast ends up making a huge symptomatic improvement. So always kind of keep in the back of your mind: is there a yeast problem here? And recognizing, even with the best testing, like this test, you can have situations where the where the um Yeast is missed. You know, you definitely have situations where yeast is missed. All right, so we're going to open it up for questions in a moment if there are any. I'm just going to mention a little bit about what's coming up at the Kalish Institute, which is we're starting a new class. Um, enrollment is open now. You get 500 bucks off if you use this particular code here. Um, the mentorship class starts September 25th in a couple weeks. We've got a greatly expanded content. We've got a fair amount of stuff actually on the GI map that we put in recently. To the training program, which is nice as an addition. Go over adrenals and GI and female hormones. And if you sign up for the full year-long program, we have a huge amount of information on organic acids. 
the way they do the six month or year long program, they have a live Q&A call every week where we review labs. It's case-based learning, meaning that we're just looking at cases and doctors are learning as they go. And at this point, we have a couple thousand case studies that are in our searchable database. And a huge amount of information that we've accumulated to really accelerate practice growth. And in addition to doing all the clinical application parts, also have a really strong interest in practice building from a business perspective. So we also want to focus on business skills development and how you can really take your practice to the next level so you feel like you're, you're in a super comfortable place in terms of not just your clinical skills, but your ability to apply them in a business model that allows you to have the time to have a life. I practice right now about 10 to 12 hours a week. And it's Tuesdays and Thursdays. I work from about, well, it's about 10 to 3, something like that. And uh, 10 to, you know, plus another hour. You know, it's like five or six hours on Tuesday, five or six hours on Thursday. And the beauty of that practice is it generates enough income for me to survive, pay all my bills, allows me to spend a lot of time teaching and a lot of time uh, perhaps driving the fast cars that I've accumulated a little too fast. So, you know, I have. I have free time. Like I can take the alpha out on, you know, on a Thursday afternoon and, you know, drive ridiculously fast for half an hour and then come home and relax. So I, I feel like my quality of life is really good because I've been able to organize my practice in a way where it's profitable. I'm not making millions and millions of dollars, but I have a lifestyle that I enjoy and I'm able to help people all at the same time. And I could probably, when I talk to my financial advisor, this guy Jason, and he'll say, okay, Dan, what are you going to do when you're 65? You know, we've got to figure this out. And, you know, and every five years we have the same conversation with, with Jason. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I, I already only work 10 hours a week. What am I going to do in retirement? I could work eight hours a week. I mean, my retirement plan in, you know, 10 or 15 years from now is to cut back two or three hours from my schedule. So I want to be able to help the largest number of people over the longest period of time. And I hope I'm still doing this stuff in my 80s and 90s. Because I was able to pace myself, you know, with my family. that's what I really want to encourage through my training programs is get people financially stable enough and get an efficient system running so that you can uh, work in a practice that you could imagine what do they call it, like retiring into. So you're not just a slave to this thing and then you quit and go play golf, but you have a practice that you can enjoy as as long as you want. And I we have a lot of doctors in the training program that are in their late 60s. 70, and they're still practicing. They're not giving up on helping people, and I, I feel like I want to encourage that as much as possible through clinical application and efficiency and, and the training and the business stuff as well. So come join us if you're interested. Here's the codes and information again, and we'll see. You can open it up for a minute or two if there's any questions, Jeff, or let me know if you have anything else that we missed. Okay, great. Th thank you, Dan. Um, we do have some questions come in. We've got a lot of really good feedback and a lot of questions, so I'll just give you a couple of them here. Um, one is an interest when you when you had the results of the Mayo Clinic study and you were able to treat H. pylori so effectively, what was the method of treatment for the H. pylori? Oh, absolutely. So we used Mastica, and most of the top companies have it, uh, Mastica. At 500 milligrams, okay, so we did two capsules three times a day. So they took 1,000 milligrams of Mastica three times a day, right. which is a lot of Mastica, but it really is effective. And they took an anti-inflammatory DGL slash glutamine type product, you know, deglycerated licorice root or glutamine type product. We used it in a powder form that I was mentioning. We actually used the, I think we used the GI Revive from Designs for Health along with the Mastica. Now, some of these companies will package the Mastica with an anti-inflammatory in it together, in which case, you know, you can just do it like that as well. Okay. Okay. Oh, for two months. I forgot to say, for 60 days. 60 days. For, and for 60 days. Okay. Yeah, 60 days, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, a question about glutamine. Um, how much glutamine? Is it by manufacturer's recommendation, or how long do you use glutamine? In the repair so, phase. Yeah, I, I use at least 3,000 to 5,000 milligrams either once or twice a day, depending on how much repair you're really trying to push. 
And that's always going to be in a powder, so it's going to be scoops of either pure glutamine or more often we use glutamine that's combined with, you know, the slippery elms of the world and the deep and straight and all that. So they're getting a, you know, the herbal anti-inflammatory effect plus the glutamine for the repair of the cells in the gut lining. And then the question is, do you want to do that before you start killing stuff to reduce inflammation? Do you want to do it during the killing to make the killing more effective? Or do you want to do it after the killing uh, to do the repair? And that just depends on how much stuff you can get that patient to take and how sick the person is. The sicker they are, the more early I introduce the glutamine products. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, a question about uh, probiotics. Do you give probiotics with food or do you do it in between meals? What do you yeah. think is... This is an age-old question. Now, we got to all acknowledge that the probiotics that we're swallowing orally are not magically ending up in the large intestine itself, right? They're, they're impacting what's going on down there, but they're going to be you know, destroyed or degraded by your digestive process by and large. So um, I generally give them with meals because it's easier for people to remember. Right. If I get a slightly obsessive compulsive patient, a, like some people are happier if you program more coffee then I'll often say you can take them once a day with food and once a day in an empty stomach. The idea being that if they mix in with your food contents, there may be some advantages to that, maybe some addition, disadvantages. But if whenever I, if I, with a normal typical patient, if I say on an empty stomach, it's just harder, they just don't remember. <laughs> Okay, one last question. We'll end it with this one. Uh, a doctor wants to know, do you always do organic acid testing and adrenal st stress testing at the same time as the GI map? Yeah, in my practice, we do all the testing up front. And this is the luxury of having done this for a while and having a decent reputation is that patients are willing to pay that much for labs up front. I totally get that if you're new in practice, you may not be able to talk someone into, you know, a thousand bucks worth of labs. But I do adrenal, GI, and organic acids prior to seeing the patient. My assistant gets that all arranged and all the testing done. And then their first consult with me is reviewing those three tests and making a plan up. Very good, very good. Well, Dr. Kalish, thank you very much for sharing that information with us and being with us this afternoon. Um, and we'll end it with that. And we will thank you again and thank our audience. All right, bye for now. Appreciate it.